Good morning. I'm just going to have to get, you're just going to have to bear with me because there are a lot of new things today. Uh, welcome to Tabernacle Church, United Church of Christ. We are together. And isn't that something to celebrate? Hallelujah. We're all together and we're in Emerson Hall, one of my favorite spaces in the church. And uh, Reverend Joe Amico is not with us today. He is at the UCC Church in Saugus, Massachusetts. He was asked by uh, our area minister to lead a service of release for the young woman who's been serving there as the bridge pastor for a time. And they need to say goodbye to her, and then they're going to invite someone to come uh, for a longer period. And that person's coming in three weeks. So that's terrific. Uh, and Joe is serving as the official rep because the area minister has to be somewhere else. Uh, so he asked me, and I was like, yes! We have students now, and we have ministerial associates. We have all kinds of people, and now we're all having to fight to get in to preach. So I was very glad uh, that they're on vacation and I could come. Uh, my name is Elizabeth King, and I uh, love this church. I'm a member of this church, and I'm glad all of you are here. Today we're celebrating uh, the end of our being separated from one another for so long. I haven't seen you all in person for a really long time. Okay, so what's, what are the rules about touching? We don't do passing of the peace. We don't, okay, well, we could look at one another with love in our hearts. Okay, we can do that. We welcome everyone who's at home. I can't see you, but I know you're there. And uh, Michael is recovering from surgery. He's home and he's watching us. Big Brother is watching. So uh, we'll try to do our best. Uh, are there announcements this morning? Come on up. You have to flip that on. Um, just an announcement for people who have read the book for our book group with the um, collaboration on racism. We're reading the revisioners. So we're gonna be meeting downstairs in the Bigelow room following the service for those of you who read the book and are able to join us. Wonderful. Oh, so, and will that be Zoom available? Can people participate from home? Sorry. Uh, yes, you can participate from home, but you'll have to email me to get the link. So I'm not sure if we'll be able to catch people, but if people are able to email me and get the link from there, um, okay. we can do that. Maybe at the very end, you can give them the link or something. Yes, I think it, it's been announced too, okay. so I think that people, um, I'm hoping that people knew because we've been announcing it for three or four weeks now. Do I have other important announcements? You don't think so, Beth. Okay. Um, well, I would like to welcome each and every one of you. Many of you know, lots of you I don't. But I would just invite you, if we're not hugging, but at least turn to the person next to you or behind you and say, so glad you're here, okay? I'm so glad you're here, Brenda. Yeah. Oh. Oh, 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 oh. Okay, with permission, we can touch. I didn't know that part. Okay, so I'm so glad you're here. Can I, can, I, can we touch? Okay, so glad you're here. So glad you're here. Hi. Hey, you. How are you? Hi. Welcome. So glad you're here. There you go. Who, I missed him. Okay, I'm kissing you all. So glad you're all here. 
And uh, together we are celebrating the fact that we have a community to come home to after this time of separation and uncertainty. And Tabernacle is certainly a place of love and welcome to everyone. So glad you're here. Brenda, would you like to come up and help with the call to worship? Would you, or would you like me to just bring you the mic? You're going to do it up here. Okay. It's going to be a really interesting morning. All right. Uh, you're not standing for the call to worship, but you're standing in spirit. Nope. Sit. Sit, Ubu. Okay. Uh, I'm one. You all are all. Okay. Beloved God, you have created the world around us so that we might discover signs of your love everywhere. Trees to dazzle us with grace. Gardens to taste summer ripened vegetables and fruits. Ocean waves to hear the constant pulse of your great heart. Grass to dance in barefooted delight. Stars to transport us into the heavens. Loving community with whom we celebrate these countless blessings. And offer you our thanks and praise. <laughs> Together we'll be singing, uh, Tis a Gift to be Simple, a Shaker uh, hymn that was written in the mid 1800s, 1854, actually, by a Quaker, a uh, Shaker. And it's actually, in addition to being a hymn of mm, praise, in the words themselves, there are directions for dancing. When you turn and you bend, literally, the shakers turned and bended in the dance in their um, sanctuaries. So if you'd like to turn and bend, feel free. Uh, and those of you who might, would like to stand, you can do so, but you can also stay seated, whatever you're most comfortable doing. Perhaps you all know that the Shakers were a band of believers, started in England. Ann Lee, Mother Ann Lee, was the leader of that group who came uh, and settled in the New World, in the colonies, and they believed very ardently that Jesus was coming again. They believed in the Second Coming and that the end of the world was near. So there was no reason, and in fact, it was important to practice celibacy and to remain pure in heart and in devotion. Um, and so working, uh, doing very simple work, uh, woodwork, uh, all kinds of stuff with seeds and germination and farming and gardening, uh, very simple life-giving things. And uh, one of the ways that they uh, perhaps let out some energy was to dance uh, in church and shake, literally shake. And uh, that filled a great need of theirs. So hence the name Shakers. 
When we're together, we have the opportunity to join our hearts in prayer. So whether you're at home or whether you're here today, uh, let us join our hearts and minds. Please pray with me. Eternal God of compassion and strength, weave your spirit into the fabric of our lives. Weave your joy into our songs, your peace into our prayers, and your justice into our most basic actions. May this worship service knit together the frayed edges of our lives so that we might be woven together in a tapestry that comforts and blesses, inspires and renews us in this world in which we live. Amen. Let us now enter a time of silence so that we might tune our hearts and minds to the presence of God. Eternal God, it is rare that we have silence in our lives. We are surrounded by conversation, by imagery, by people and places and things and movement. Surrounded so deeply that Sometimes it's hard for us to feel your presence within us and between us and around us. Jesus took quiet time in the midst of his movement from village to village, from healing to preaching to storytelling to dancing. He always took time to be with you in prayer. And when the disciples asked him, how should we pray, Jesus? He, he said, well, pray something like this. Please join me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I love this. Right here it says, words of assurance. Now, generally, words of assurance follow a time of confession. I don't have a confession, but I want to know what you all want to confess. Uh, we've had a lot of time where we haven't been talking with one another about things we've done that we wish we hadn't, things we wish we had said to someone or reached out to someone and we didn't. What are the things that we have neglected in our own personal lives, in our marriages, in our relationship with our children or our parents, our neighbors, our friends? We're sinners, right? Part of why we're in church, because we know we don't always get it 
right. In fact, we know that a lot of times we're just dead wrong. God loves us anyway. That's the word of assurance. God loves us whether we get it right or whether we make terrible mistakes, innocent mistakes, hurt those we love, hurt ourselves, so often not intentionally. God loves us despite our sinfulness, our brokenness, and the ways in which we, we do our best. God loves us completely and unconditionally. Those are the words of assurance. Thanks be to God. Amen. You're, would you like me to bring you the mic? Would you like the mic? You're going to come up again. Well, why don't I just do this? Okay. Well, it doesn't really work, does it? That's why. Oh, come on. We have all this eye deck gear. Let's use it. Okay. <laughs> don't, put, don't poke my eye out. I have to read these long words. <laughs> Our first scripture. You have to be closer. It's on. You got to be closer. There you go. Our Old Testament reading comes from Second Samuel, chapter six, verses one through five, and twelve b through nineteen. And at Bible study on Wednesday night, after Joe read this, he said, "Good luck, Brenda." <laughs> David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, thirty thousand. David and all the people with him set out and went from Bala Judah to bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of Hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. They carried the Ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on a hill. Uzar and ah Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the Ark of God. And Ohio went in front of the ark. David and all the house of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all their might, with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. It was told King David, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the Ark of God from the house of Obadam to the city of David with rejoicing. With those who bore the Ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed an ox and a fatling. David danced before the Lord with all his might. He was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the Ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. They brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place, inside the tent that David had pitched for it, and David offered burnt offerings and offerings of well-being before the Lord. When David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the offerings of well-being, he blessed the people in the, in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed among all the people the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, to each a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins. Then all the people went back to their homes. Pause. That's a really rich text, isn't it? When Joe called and asked if I wanted to preach this particular week, he said, you can follow the lectionary readings or you can choose your own scripture. And I often followed the lectionary readings, uh, but I, I didn't know what it was gonna be, so I looked it up and it was all about David dancing, which is crazy, right? It's crazy. 
uh, I actually watched a movie last night called King David that Richard Gere starred in in 1984. And Richard Gere rips his robe off and he's wearing an ephod. <laughs> there was some conversation about where the ephod goes. Was, he had a little ephod down here and he dances as he and the Ark of the Covenant enter into through the gates of Jerusalem. It's crazy. You should go and watch this. At least watch his entrance and his dancing. Because he leaps and he twirls and he whirls and he looks, I mean, before he takes the robe off and starts dancing and takes his crown off and sets it aside, you can tell he's scared. You know, you can tell that he's a little worried about how people respond to this because he's the king. Kings don't cut loose like this, right? Okay, so he's dancing. His wife, Michal, sees from a window. She's not even there for the big procession. She's angry at him. She doesn't like the way he's cavorting around. And uh, actually, they have a, if, you, if we went a little further, they have a little tiff about this. She says, I was ashamed to be your wife. Almost. That's almost what she says. And he says, look, you know what? I was dancing for the Lord. And if that's an embarrassment to you or an embarrassment to me or something I should be ashamed of, then I'm happy to be ashamed because it's all for God. It's all for God. It's not for me. So get over it. It's basically what he says. That marriage did not last long. <laughs> Bathsheba comes next to give you a taste of what happens next. He's married a lot of times. He has a lot of children. I couldn't even, I think over 20 children. Uh, so anyway, Michal doesn't last. But what do you make of this wonderful, let's share food thing after the dance? It's like a great big coffee hour. Right? We're going to share the offerings that were made. And that's something that we often forget, that the offerings that were brought to the priests in Jerusalem were distributed out to the people. They weren't kept just for the priests. They didn't sit inside the temple and rot. They were shared with the community. And I love that, what is it, cakes of raisin cakes, a cake of raisins. Everyone got cake of bread, a portion of meat, which was, you know, having meat was a luxury, and a cake of raisins, something sweet. And then all the people, there were something like over a quarter of a million people supposedly gathered to watch this incredible homecoming of the Ark of the Covenant. Can you help me, Betsy? So that's what David was so excited about. My handle's okay. This is the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> yeah. Only there were four priests, one on, one on each pole. pole. And inside were Oh, I can't. Okay, we'll just say that there are scrolls. And there were also the Ten Commandments written on the tablets, supposedly. That's what was in there. The other thing that was inside here was Shekinah, was the light of God, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of Lord, uh, the glory of God, the Spirit of God, lived inside the Ark of the Covenant. And that is what David was finally de delivering to Jerusalem after years and years and years of fighting the Philistines, the Ammonites, I don't know, all the tribes. 
he had to push out of the way so they could claim <clears throat> the promised land. So it's a joyful dance. It's a dance of praise and wonder and celebration beyond our imagining. It's a dance of ecstasy. That's what I'd like you to remember. Readings two, second reading. The New Testament reading comes from Mark 6, verses 14 through 29. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work at him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet, like the one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous man and a holy man, and he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? Her mother replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me the, at once the head of John the baptizer on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for his guest, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the god with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. May God add our understanding of these holy words. Okay, so when I read these two passages side by side and thought, I'm supposed to preach about this? Who created the lectionary to knit these two passages together so that they had to be examined and explored at the same time. That's very interesting, right? Why did the lectionary creators bring uh, Solomon and Mark together so that we have this crazy clash between a beautiful, inspired, ecstatic dance of David to God and we have a dance by a young woman who's been named Salome through history. Her name, she's not named in the passage, but that's the name that's given to her. And uh, she's young, obviously, we know that. And what kind of dancing do you think she might have been doing that would so enthrall Herod to offer half of his kingdom? What do you think she was up to? Be suspicious. Was she doing the hokey pokey? Was she waltzing? Liturgical dancing, perhaps? No. The yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Do we have any castanets or cymbals? That's all right. But, you know, she probably had a tambourine, you know, she was mm, 
the thought through the ages has been that the intent was to arouse Herod and to be so beautiful and so mm, seductive that he would, in fact, offer her anything. Now, probably she and her mother, Herodias, planned this. That's also the assumption. That it's actually Herodias who sets this whole thing in motion. Because it's Herodias who wins, hands down. Because what does she do? She gets rid of John the Baptist who is a faithful Jewish prophet, who is someone who said publicly, you too, Herod and Herodias, should not be getting married. You're both married to other people. Divorce, just because you want to be with someone else, is not acceptable. It's against Jewish law. So he was being uh, critical of them, and Herodias couldn't stand this. So she and her stepdaughter proceed, marry into Herod's family, and, well, they were already there because Herod's brother was the problem, uh, the first husband of Herodias. So Herod has a birthday, he invites all the important people, and she begins her dance. And some, Oscar Wilde wrote a piece called The Dance of the Seven Veils. And it's, you know, the, uh, the business about revealing oneself, veil after veil after veil. And I think Herod was in the palm of her hand. And so she knows, she and her mother know that he is probably going to be in the palm of her pant hand. She's too beautiful to ignore. And so she runs asks her mother, what should I ask for? Mother says, John the Baptist. I want his head on a platter. That's barbaric, but it was common. <laughs> That's one of the ways that uh, people were executed at the time. I noticed you did not provide us with a head no. this morning. I appreciate that. In Salem, we, you probably could have found one at one of the Halloween stores, but it is Salem. But uh, Herod is presented with a man who he has respected and, in fact, wanted to protect and probably put him in jail in protective custody. He's now had to have someone murdered and executed for this wife of his, who now has gotten away with somebody who was criticizing her and him, and uh, she, just, she just wins everything. But it's a dance of seduction, a dance of revenge, and a dance of death. That's a radically different kind of dance than what we're told David is doing in Jerusalem. And unfortunately, throughout history, women have been portrayed as the seducers, almost always. That's our role. And uh, it's, I think it should always be viewed with uh, suspicion and a grain of salt why is the woman always blamed for the mischief, uh, the malfeasance, the corruption, the death? Um, but it is this uh, conflict of how bodies are used. How do we use our body in time and space? How do we act? How do we live? Are we to be the incarnation of God? We're made in God's image. Is our body holy, right? Or is it something to be used to gain favor, gain power, uh, get what we want at any cost? And this kind of um, 
conflict is still going on, right? We're not done with this, unfortunately. Uh, there are lots of churches. Did any of you grow up in churches where dancing was not permitted? Dancing was permitted uh, in my Methodist church. In my grandmother's church, a Disciples of Christ uh, church, dancing was not allowed. Um, I grew up with a stepfather who would not allow us to play cards on Sunday, uh, nor could we go to the movie theater on Sunday. And uh, of course, there was no drinking. And forget dancing. He would never have gone for the dancing either. But there's a way in which there is this tension between um, the power and the beauty of the human body and the ways in which uh, it can be used and in fact lead to sexual temptation. That's the fear. That's what gets cut loose and projected onto women through time. Uh, priests, male priests in the Catholic Church danced in worship for the first several hundred years, and then that was stopped. The Reformation comes in, and Martin Luther is not for dancing, it is not okay. Uh, and the Puritans and the pilgrims who came here, they were accustomed in England dancing culturally uh, in pubs, in the streets, in one's home, that was acceptable. That, uh, making music, uh, playing the violin, singing, those were a primary form of entertainment, right? And even uh, Cotton Mather, I think it's Cotton Mather, writes about the fact that, okay, there's all this dancing going on in the colonies. We can't stop it, right? But at the very least, could the women dance with the women and the men dance with the men? Because it all goes sideways when the men and the women dance together. So let's just not let that happen. Make sure that doesn't happen. And dancing, okay. It's okay for us because it's exercise. We learn good manners. Uh, we meet new people. We meet our prospective spouses this way. I love this. There's certain kinds of dancing, and it has to be orderly dancing. There has to be a caller. There has to be someone who's giving the directions for how to turn and bend, right? And all of this, a bell rang in my head because I remembered that Bob and Jen Strom in this room for eight or nine years hosted contra dancing eight or nine years, they had 50 to 60 people dancing in this very room in an orderly way. Contra dancing always has um, a caller or a director. That means thousands of hours of dancing in this sacred holy space. Is that cool or what? I love that. Uh, do you all know of any other mm, times there was dancing here at Tabernacle through the years? I'm betting there was square dancing somewhere, sometime. Nancy? When we have uh, Easter angels dancing up the aisle, absolutely. I think, actually, the Sunday that Joe was installed here, he had liturgical dancers from Boston come and dance. And yes, there's definitely been the angels. We definitely had shepherds and Christmas pageant, right? The stars danced on this very stage, I'm sure of it. Um, I think we had some young women who did Irish step dancing or sword dancing or something. Um, Bagpipe concerts and you had Irish step dancing? Yes! Dancing, so much dancing. Joyful, playful dancing. There are lots of people who say that uh, 
the contra dancing was one of their favorite things to do because it returned them to a childlike state. It was play. And uh, you didn't have to be good at it. You didn't have to know the steps. You'd learn. They would teach you as you went. And it could be intergenerational, and you didn't have to bring a partner. Everybody had a way in to be able to dance. And I asked them if they could come, actually, this Sunday, and they're in the Berkshires making music. So uh, they send us their love, and uh, we send them our love. There's one other dance I, I know of, quite special. Heather Bennett turned 21 how many years ago? 20? A while ago. 16 or 17 years ago, somewhere in that. 2004, 18 years, thank you. Well, no, 17, yeah. Okay, 17 years ago, Heather Bennett had a 21st birthday party downstairs in the hall. And did Steve DJ? Steve Nelson, Liz's husband, brought his records and stereo stuff and he uh, DJed the dancing and the party. And how many people were there? About a hundred people. Nancy has a great big smile on her face. There was so much joy in that room. And there was all kinds of dancing. Every kind of dancing you can imagine. And uh, the communities, everyone that knew and loved Heather came together people who'd never met one another before, sharing food, there was so much laughter, there was so much love, and the church basement was filled with dancing. That's what churches are for, right? Churches are a vessel, an environment, a sacred place where all kinds of people can come. People with whole bodies, people with bodies that are broken, people in wheelchairs, people who are intellectually challenged, people who are from Mensa and everybody in between, people who speak English and people who don't speak English well. I totally forgot about um, all the quinceanera parties that happened in the basement when the Spanish church worshiped here. Wow, was the basement filled with dancing and singing. But to come together in love and with joy is the purpose of a church, one of the purposes of the church. And from my understanding that night, I don't know, was Heather walking on air? That night, was she just completely blown away by the whole thing? It was no big deal? Yeah. I think she was tired, but I have to imagine she was pretty happy. Okay. Because she had birthday parties, but I don't think anything that grand before. This was really, this was it. And what time did you find her? And when Betsy walked into her bedroom the next morning at 6.30, Heather was gone. Somewhere in the night, she had died. There was no sign that death was imminent. But I just have to tell you, that's, I'd like to go that way. <laughs> I'd like a great big party with dancing and love and very good food. 
and then go to sleep knowing how loved knowing how precious she was in the sight of everyone, in the sight of God. And she got to go home. That's also the purpose of church, I think. So when I think of all the dancing, all the different kinds of dancing that we've talked about this morning, I imagine Heather dancing with the stars, right? And I know that I really look forward to joining her sometime and dancing with her. And all those whom we know and love who are up there dancing away, having a great time, looking forward to the moment when we join them. Amen. Now, it's time in our service when we have the opportunity to uh, gather our concerns and celebrations to share those. And uh, Jack, you're going to have to tell me if there are people waving on the screen. Let us join our hearts and minds in prayer this morning. God, for all those people whose names we share just now, we ask your continued healing and blessing upon them. For all those whom we now name in our hearts, We ask you to enfold them in your tender care, providing them with the strength and the support they most need. And those needs change in a moment. We pray for those who are grieving, those who have lost loved ones, those who have lost hope And we pray for those who are models for us of what it means to be courageous in the face of devastating news. People who teach us how important it is to reach out and ask for help when we need it. Help us not be overwhelmed by the needs of this world, but be even more committed to a life of service and devotion, friendship and love to those near and far. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus, our friend and our savior. Amen. Amen. So we've already sung the tune to this. It's tis a gift to be simple. Uh, the author of this wrote it in the 60s. And uh, he was borrowing um, Appalachian Spring, the tune and the melody from Appalachian Spring written by Aaron Copeland in the 1950s, who uh, took it from the Shaker tradition. So it's a couple of generations removed using that same tune. And often this is sung on Easter Sunday. Uh, and perhaps liturgical dancing has been done in the midst of it. 
So if you'd like, please stand. And if you'd like to remain seated, please do so. church can be so much fun. Amen. Jesus is the Lord of the dance, and we are called to be partners in the dance of life, in the dance of love, in the dance of joy. Let us do so with hearts filled with love and gratitude. Amen.
I'd invite all of you to remember to uh, drop your offering at the table in the back. I don't know if there's a basket there. Is there a basket there? Uh, I'll hold my hands out like this, <laughs> if that will help. Although you might have so many offerings and gifts that it wouldn't fit in the two palm of my hand, but I'll try. And if you don't have it here, please send it to church or use the donate button on the upper right-hand corner of our website, tabernaclechurch.org. Did I ever think in my entire life I would ask you to do that? No. But it's the way of the world. And I wish we were having coffee hour together, but we're not. Not yet. But we're going to... We're, we're, moving in that direction. Just having this many of you present today is a blessing. Uh, if there are people you haven't seen for a while or people who might need a ride, please consider calling them and asking them if you can bring them to church. Anthony, because we will just feel more and more connected when more of us are present. All right? So blessings to you and your week, and uh, hope to see you next week. Peace.